This is Full Steam, a series that profiles some of the most influential people in the Irish tech scene, all of whom just happen to be women. My guest this week is Amanda Roach Kelly, who tells us how her passion for food from a young age led her to head up Just Eat. Firstly, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Um, tell me a little bit about you growing up. What kind of a child were you? Where did you grow up? Um, so I'm from Dublin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the eldest child of three. Um, I have one younger sister, one younger brother. So I guess um, being the eldest, I, I am your stereotypical first child. Uh, a bit of a leader, uh, a little bit bossy. Uh -huh. um, no, not, I suppose just you know uh, practical um you know i i did everything first in the family um including getting into trouble you know um but i definitely would be uh, a typical firstborn um, and as i said i grew up in dublin so born and raised in dublin i i live in wicklow now but okay. we, we moved to just the edge of dublin into wicklow so not too far and so did you have a clear idea of what you want to be when you grow up um from not really i mean from a young age with my family we did a lot of traveling okay and i love traveling um, and my parents always encouraged that uh, in me and in in my siblings as well and also we were really into food so and uh, you know it, it it's no coincidence that i've ended up in yeah. just eat and throughout my career i've worked in that kind of hospitality food area but um but no I, I i'll be honest i didn't have a particular thing in mind i didn't want to be a nurse or a doctor um but definitely i'd say my influences when i was young have definitely had a, an influence now on what i've ended up doing so what did you do when you left school i did marketing when i left school marketing okay. in french and um, so again from traveling i spent a lot of time in france growing up and I just particularly love the language. Um, marketing, I suppose I was just really into brands. Um, and I suppose only as I got into my career did I realize why that's why I loved marketing, as I realized the importance of brands and you know the fun you could have with brands. Um, so I applied for Marketing French, I got it, did that, um, but then I ended up in sales. I, I went for a marketing roles and was given advice around like start out on the road if you can with brands you know getting to know customers getting to know um, your clients whether it be in my case it was restaurants or uh, when I worked for Pernod Ricard it was publicans mm -hmm. you know so um, I kind of went into marketing back to sales and it, it's great it gave me a really all-round experience for uh, a lot of what helps me nowadays you know with managing the whole business but uh, certainly would have more of a flair for the marketing and sales, sales side and from a sales point of view sales strikes me as a tough gig like i don't talk to someone unless i absolutely have to <laughs> whereas yeah. in sales it's all about your your connection with people yeah did that come naturally to you it does yeah it's funny um yeah i mean look everybody i think naturally is a little bit nervous when you're meeting someone new mm -hmm. or you know having to enter a room and, and start a conversation but i definitely find it easier than most um and i've been told that like my husband would be a much quieter person who always says you just walk into a room and it's you know i know i can leave you alone yeah. um so that's a natural thing for me but but inside i think we all feel the same you know that we all have these little things of will people like me or will people even listen to me and um, so that's when in in an actual when you use it in your career it's really important you're selling something you believe in and that you know loads about so again you need to know your product you need to know the, the people you're talking to so have done your research about why would they want what you're talking about and that show like for me it's just a passion for what you're selling and luckily any jobs I've had, I've always sold, even though they might be like some of the weirdest things, um, but you just get into it. It's funny, it's, it's, if you have a passion and a genuine interest or believe in the product, it's easy to sell it. Um, and people are the best, you know, it's just great. You meet so many different types of people. You do have to adapt to different types of people, but um, yeah, it definitely comes more naturally to me than, than others. And have you ever found it intimidating or has there ever been a scenario where you've walked into a room and go, oh God? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I know the feeling. When you ask me that question, I definitely know the feeling. Yeah. But I don't think it was 
a, a big, you know, as big an event that it would have been kind of so memorable, like one or two, one or two um, kind of occasions. Yeah. Um, I just think new people, I think, you know, everybody is nervous. You know, we have that natural thing in us of wanting to be liked and wanting to be heard. Um, no matter who you are, you yeah. know, and I, I think, and I think it's good to have it. It's called, I, you know, I would define it as nerves. Um, and as you said, I spoke at Tech Connect before. I didn't want to get up and stand in front of four hundred people. I, you know, I got that feeling. Yeah. But when you're up there and suddenly you're talking, you look out, you find a friendly face, and you're talking about something you know and love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always, as a rule, tried to work in roles or in companies that I really knew about and wanted to work for and I've been really lucky I have got the roles that I've looked for because it just makes things so much easier because you're actually genuinely interested so when you go in you don't get that oh feeling because yeah. you know what you're there to talk about. So when you were in the sales and marketing side of things then what kind of companies and what products were you putting out there? So my first product that my first job was selling tights would you believe okay. it so um yeah so nothing to do with food and nothing to do with restaurants or anything that i'm in now uh, but it was to get into the branded space so i went specifically with for my first role with an idea of i want to work with big brands and i well, i got a job in in a company called swedish match so they would have traditionally, and I was kind of the, one of the first in to change a bit of their company, they would have traditionally sold big brands, very male-oriented brands like Wilkinson Sword, um, you know, lots of kind of, uh, I suppose, hygiene products for men. Mm -hmm. And they decided, they were a distribution company into retail, and they decided they wanted to take on a hosiery brand um, in the south of Ireland, and they took on a brand called Aristoc. Um, and we, they needed a girl to sell tights, basically. So they, they brought me in to do that. Uh, but what they did was they put me in a high ace van with a big boot of tights and sent me around Ireland. Very and that was my first job, yeah. yeah. And um, it, was, it was great. And it got me that kind of, it was a real, it was just real life. I was driving around, I was going into retail outlets and trying to get a stand of tights in. But again, I had the backing of this bigger distribution company with big brands behind me. Um, so that was my first job. And then from there, I ultimately always wanted to get involved in the wine and spirits industry. So mm -hmm. I was looking at the likes of Diageo or um, Irish Distillers. And luckily, I did get a job then in Irish Distillers. And I was their um, wine rep. So I was their representative for all their portfolio of wines. Um, in Dublin so that's where my kind of tapping into the restaurant industry yeah. like I'd worked at waitressing during college and stuff but just getting to know owners and managers and wine and food and pairing and stuff it was brilliant it was a really really exciting job um, and then I moved from there into coffee so then I moved to Bewley's um, and again, not That's really looking... a good looking. brand to work with if you're yeah, talking about brands. Totally. So I moved from the likes in Irish Distillers. It was um, Jacobs Creek, Gallo, mm -hmm. Long Mountain, uh, Cork Dry Gin, Smirnoff, Powers, Paddy, Jemison, like great brands. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Bewley's, the most traditional coffee brand. Um, and I moved at a really good time because uh, coffee was only starting to take off in Ireland. So it was quite competitive, but we were still seen as the reliable, trusting brand. Yeah. Um, and again, I was dealing with the same sort of customers, restaurants and cafes and bars and hotels and stuff. Um, and then I moved to Just Eat. So I really haven't been, you know, in too, selling too many products. Yeah. But they all have a theme, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. And yeah. it's good to know. So when you were starting out going from the tights into mm. the booze, yeah. you know, w was it that you knew that you could sell the wine, you knew you were interested in learning about the different types of alcohol, or was it just that it was a better paid gig? Um, for me, it was more when I was, I suppose, it was the brands that attracted me. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely wasn't the, the pay or anything. I was moving kind of a, at one level at that time. I yeah. was a sales representative. I went in, um, but I just didn't want to sell tights forever, you know. And also the other brands in Swedish Match didn't interest me at all. As I said, they were more, um, they were more for a male market. Yeah. Um, and that was another theme that started. I tended to be the only female rep on teams of male 
How did um, you find that? Fine. Yeah, fine. I mean, I never, ever found it in any way strange. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and it probably led to the way I think about my team and just teams in general. It's just people. It really is just people. So you never found yourself adapting to fit in as like one of the lads? You just were yourself? Yeah, no, I never did. It's funny, it's a question people ask because yeah. I was the only girl in Swedish Match. I then became the only girl in Irish Distillers. And a lot of the brands that we were selling were quite, you know, like Powers, Paddy, Jemison, mm. The Whiskey a lot of um, kind of male, masculine influences around the business and stuff, they were the big brands. But no, I, I never did. I always found it, you know, I think, again, when you go in to sell something, it's about the product. Um, and moving from tights to, say, the wine, from traveling when I was younger, I had an interest in wine, but I didn't know anything about it. I knew there was red and white, yeah. you know, and I knew I liked I'm it. I'm still at that stage. Yeah, that so, that. but they sent me on all my courses, and okay. again, knowledge is key. So I got to a certain level, I have my diploma in wine, and like walking into a restaurant and you're up against the maitre d', mm -hmm. you had to feel you knew what you were talking about. So like I got so much more than just getting a job, I got lots of additional study out of it and stuff. Um, and again, then it's funny, uh, Bewley's, the coffee is very similar to wine, the whole production of coffee and stuff. Yeah. So that just led naturally into me knowing and being really interested in that. Um, so yeah, it wasn't really, I wasn't moving. Uh, my, my career has been very, um, it's just happened. There weren't many times I went, I want to move. Yeah. Um, I've been very lucky that things have happened upon me and it's been the right time. When you associate yourself with brands like that, like Bewley's and the, the drinks brands that mm. you mentioned, when, tome, when someone takes a slap at the brand, do you feel it personally because you put so much of yourself into Definitely. putting that out there? Definitely, yeah. And does that get hard, like, easier to deal with over time or the more you invest yourself, does it get harder? Oh no, look, you understand it. I mean, you know, everyone has a choice and people prefer different brands over one over the other, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's like wine, you know, you could sell somebody a 30 bottle of wine or a three, or three, 30 euro bottle of wine or a three euro. It's what they like. They'll pay 30 euro if they think it's lovely. We all have different tastes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think on the brand side, you feel it personally if you, if you put so much work into something and you just you almost want to kind of tell you just don't understand why other people don't get you know yeah. how good this particular brand is um but but it stays with you as well like i know from if i'm out now i will still frown upon anyone ordering anything other than Bewley's. if the Bewley's is an option on a list of coffee i even though i don't work for them yeah. anymore like they they were my bread and butter for whatever, six years. Mm -hmm. I'll always order Bewley's. It's the same when I'm out, you know, drinking wine or whatever. I look for the brand that I used to sell because it's just, it's in you. It's almost in your blood. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. When you've sold it, it is. Yeah, and so what was your, your role up until the point where you left Bewley's? What was it that you were doing exactly there? So I was a sales manager in Bewley's. Okay. Yeah, so um, I was looking after the Leinster area. So that's their biggest area. And I had sales reps under me um, and key account managers. So yeah, it was the Haraka, which would be hotels, restaurants and cafes. That's the... The lingo, Jesus, yeah, yeah okay. um, that was my area and yeah, it was the most profitable area in the business, doing very well. Again, you know, I really, really enjoyed it. I just eat came knocking. I wasn't looking to move. I just had two kids working in Bewley's. They were really good to me. You know, I kind of saw it as my forever job. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I wasn't planning a move at all. And then uh, I was approached about just eat. So, uh, and yeah. what was the pitch? What, what year did you move to Just Eat, and what, what was the pitch at that stage? Um, I moved in 2012. Okay. Yeah. So, um, they, <laughs> the pitch was I went in as head of sales, uh -huh. and the pitch was we need somebody to, to sell this in Ireland, basically. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, it wasn't, it was a funny one. They came to me and they asked me, did I know of Just Eat? And now at that stage, I would still have rung my takeaway. I wasn't, you know, I had a couple of apps on it's my still, phone. It's still, although the business is around, it's yeah. still a relatively new concept oh, if no, you think is. about, you know, how long it is since you yeah. picked up the phone to the takeout rather than just yeah. the app. So yeah, no, it is. I it's could it's that, still yeah. really young and new. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, when they approached me, I. It's funny, it's like anyone I talk to now, even a, a couple of years later, like I'm nearly seven years there now. Um, it's. 
it's a sticker in a window, isn't it? I knew it as a sticker in a window, but yeah. I didn't really know what it was. Uh -huh. um, I kind of possibly thought it was kind of a health and safety thing, or, you know, it was that's how little I knew about them. Yeah. And, um, and again, wasn't looking to move. But it, it's coincidentally, when I was approached about it, I was going on holidays. So I had time to actually look into it. Mm -hmm. So I did a bit of research and I don't know what it was. I just was interested. Um, again, it was back into the food space, dealing with a lot of the restaurants I would have dealt with before uh, when I worked for Irish Distillers or Perna Ricard around the wine side of things. Yeah. You know, and it all just kind of, it just interested me. Um, and again, I suppose I, I kind of felt you know, it's not it's not that far from what I'm doing at the moment anyway. Um, like, if you don't take a chance, you don't know. I don't know what it was, but something just made me go and meet the, the current managing director for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And literally an hour later, I walked away going, yeah, I want that job. And, it, you know, it was just the brand, the the vision, like, oh, it just, it just felt right. And I'd handed in my notice then that whatever within a week wow um yeah so from something like from the start of a month when i was happy out working mm -hmm. in Bewley's to the end of the month i was leaving was all very what just happened there um and was it emotional working or walking away from Bewley's because you'd been there for so long um it, it was but i i guess you're still me i still meet most of the people okay. i worked with you're it's a very small industry that mm -hmm. whole restaurant side like I still meet people I worked in Irish distillers a lot around um no I think I was just really excited so I, I I don't think I ever got that emotionally invested you know you spend a lot of time at work but my outside work is as important to me mm -hmm. um, and I always made sure it, it stayed that way so for me it was like great this is a new opportunity um, and I know I'll still see the people I want to see anyway so um, it wasn't that big big a pull and so when you made the move was it the website or was the, was it the app like what I'm trying to think back to that time when where well, was we the did, technology? They didn't have an app yeah, when so I made the move so it was website, web yeah and yeah. um, so I mean we've come on massively tech wise since I joined. And was that part of the appeal or was it just the you getting back into the restaurant -y sphere? I, th I think it was the tech side to okay. be honest and um, it was just something new um, because everything I'd done so far in that industry was so traditional mm -hmm. you know um, and it is a very traditional industry. There are only a few brands, a few players, very hard to break into. And I just saw something in this that it's just a whole new approach. You know, I love my food and it just interested me that you could be talking to a whole new different customer who this is the future. Like yeah. it, it was really about the future and um, like everything else still survives and keeps going. But y like you have to change. And I just saw it as this is my chance within that old kind of almost historical industry, yeah. traditional industry, this is a little bit of a change. So I thought it'd be just very interesting to explore it. And so in your first role there, were you the person going out to the different restaurants and explaining to them what it was. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, even as recent as a few years ago, yeah. you'd overhear conversations of people going, well, this is going to shut the restaurant down, yeah. rather than it bringing a separate avenue that yeah. gives you a website without having to have a website. Yeah, no, that's exactly what my job was. Um, and I had a team under me as well, so, um, which actually most of them are still with me. It's great. But uh, yeah, we had a very... Uh, not a, it wasn't a tough job it was just challenging because people didn't get it it's new yeah well, they just didn't get hard, it yeah. so number one they didn't really get the tech side mm -hmm. which as you said people still don't get it they don't quite understand how the order gets there and delivered yeah. and stuff which as a customer sitting at home you don't have to mm -hmm. as long as it works and it's quality yeah. and on time you know then you're happy mm -hmm. but the restaurants if you think about your local wherever you live your local area and restaurants they are very traditional you know they would have a till mm -hmm. that's about it and a phone and you have to go in and and kind of assure them that it works you know we will yeah. send you orders but also assure them that it's worth it you are going to be paying us for these orders um, but it is worth it because we will spend your money wisely so for somebody like you were almost teaching them this is the way business is going if you don't get involved you're going to get left behind but it's very hard to get involved so we're going to be almost like a big player mm -hmm. that will help you so where 
you as an individual restaurant couldn't be on a Lewis or on a bus stop advertising on TV, we can. So we will advertise people to come to us and who in turn will come to you, but we don't do that for free. So yeah, but but again, it's 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 a very simple concept. Yeah. And I think that's what I liked it originally or why I liked it when they approached me. Once it was explained, literally in an hour, mm -hmm. and then I got the enthusiasm of, of the person that I had been approached by, it was just like, why wouldn't you? Like, it really was a no-brainer to me. Yeah. It is such a simple, simple proposition. Um, but the restaurant has to be happy that they're getting value for money. Just like the customer sitting at home, it's value. Um, so that was our job, to go out and really explain it. You know, it didn't take long, but that they really got that this is good for business. We're not competing with you. Mm. We're just, it's added value. And I guess since moving from head of sales into managing director, I could then broaden that added value. We're not just sending you orders. Our scale and our size can now allow you to get deals on merchandise, deals on menus, deal, you know, so yeah. it's all about added value for the restaurants. But I think the first point is just that key of we're not, we're not evil, we're not bad, we're not a competitor, we're actually here to help your business. Um, and that was, yeah, ultimately going back to your question, that was my job. And so what was the biggest challenge in those days? Was it getting people's buy-in or was it, you know, getting the, the drivers and the team to be able to, you know, deliver on your vision? Um, no, the, the, the challenge, I guess the challenge was buy-in was great. People okay. really got it once, you know, we had a really good way of explaining it. And as I said, it is quite a simple concept. Yeah. Um, but I suppose the handing then your brand over to someone else. So effectively, they then had control over, over how people perceive Just Eat. I'm so interested by this yeah. because if I have a bad experience, yeah. if the food is crappy, I'm not going to use the brand, like your app again, whereas, exactly. you, yes, you have no real control over that yeah. to a certain extent. But I suppose this is whatever number of years ago, like that's seven years ago, we've worked since then to bring restaurants along with us. Okay. So restaurants understand unless you give that like almost seamless experience, they won't order off you again, which in turn will affect Just Eat, yeah. but will affect you. Okay. Um, and it's actually quite easy to give a seamless experience. Mm -hmm. You're making a promise to us and to your customer that you will prepare the food, it'll be good food, and it'll be delivered on time. Um, but we, we put fixes in that allow them to push out a, a delivery time. Like if they are having a really busy Saturday night, yeah. they can add time. So you at home will see, look, this is actually going to take an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and you can decide and just cancel your order and go somewhere else. So all these little things. But again, it's been learning. Like we were a new business. So it's taken us years to get to the point of now that we have everything, every conceivable kind of thing that might happen that will affect the restaurant, we have covered because ultimately it does affect Just Eat. Um, but restaurants are great, they, they, they're business. They do, like, they're in it as well for the same thing. They want customers to come back to them. So they just try and provide the best experience. Um, and like that, if we have a restaurant that doesn't try that or doesn't, just can't do it for some reason, we will work with them. Okay. You know, and we will say, look, like our reps are out in the road constantly in and out of restaurants, looking at their timing of deliveries, their staffing, everything. To be, to be able to help them. So again, that's part of our added value. We don't just put you on the site and then see you. Yeah. Um, we have to make sure that they work well with us and, and that we can help them as well. Yeah, one thing that intrigues me by, uh, about Just Eat is like the inner nerd in me wanting to know about the data that you yeah. guys have because <laughs> it's real-time information. You can see, yeah. you know, halftime during a rugby match, orders are probably going to shoot up and mm -hmm. you'll know, you know what parts of the country they're going to be in. How does that data then inform your business but then also the restaurants around the country? Yeah, so I, I guess we hold so much data and you're right, I know exactly what everyone is doing and mm -hmm. what food you're eating and everything. But look, unfortunately, we don't have time to look into it in that much detail. Yeah. Um, it could be a bit creepy, but, uh, but no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, we use it to inform. It, it's brilliant. Data is gold. You mm -hmm. know, it really is. Um, but I suppose for restaurants, so how we use that for added value for our restaurants is just as you said, we know nationally what people like to consume, what time they consume it at, um, like down to soft drinks, we could tell you. So we know what's lacking in areas and what there's too much of. 
So we will go out and, as I said, our sales reps will be, go in and they do business reviews in areas mm -hmm. and they'll advise around, okay, your cuisine type is, you know, is there's 20 of you in this area. Um, you, maybe you need to be a little bit different to, to get people to come and order to you or order from you. Or in it, like our restaurants now know that we can do that. So they'll come to us if they're looking to open another site and say, we need it. We've money to open another site. What area should we open in? Now, again, we won't tell them because we're not consultants and yeah. um, we can't guarantee business, but we will certainly advise. Mm -hmm. Like we know where we know everything there is to know about food and where it is in Ireland. Um, but it's great for customers as well. I guess for customers, it means that we can offer so much choice. So for wherever you're sitting, whether you're at home or at work or out with, you know, in, in someone else's house, mm -hmm. you can be guaranteed that because we use our data, that if you go on to Just Eat, you'll pretty much get something like of everything in one area. And that's our goal is to be able to provide a, a range of food. Like we've over 40 cuisine types now. Um, a range of quality food at the right time in every area. Um, and it's a challenge because obviously, you know, once you leave Dublin or Cork or Limerick, it does get more challenging um, having, you know, I suppose, fitting out and making sure that, that they have all the cuisine types. Um, but luckily, as I said, restaurants these days and chains and that, they're business savvy. They know where they need to go. We help them with that. And they're willing to invest, which is brilliant. Um, but it is data is gold. It's amazing the the stuff that we we uh, that we have. Yeah. And so, what you know, are you guys looking at new technology that you can put on your site and your app to make the user experience that bit better? You know, I get emails every now and then going, "You haven't had pizza in two days. Mm. Maybe you had another pizza." Like, yeah. is that going to come on the site and the app a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And it's all it's just development. It's we we actually can't do it quick enough yeah. for the way tech is at the moment. Um, like literally our our tech side of the business product and tech is huge it's based in bristol and um, we have a tech hub and they're constantly just pushing out new updates and new developments within product and um, so our user experience is currently it can always be bettered because there's always something new yeah so you know you can use you can order through alexa or you can follow your driver on a map but there's always and what i love is there's always customers telling us Ah, yeah, but you could be doing this, and we go right. Let's look at that. So that's where we need customers to inform us, um, and particularly around uh, Ireland. Irish customers are great because we love traveling. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, "Oh, I was over here and I saw this," and they'll tell us what they want. And it all goes back into this hopper of tech and product and tech, and we just spit out as much as we can as quickly as possible. But um, there's a lot of work involved in what. To someone sitting at home, a driver on a map yeah. is, oh, wow, that's great. You know, the, the background would be, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind it. But there's developments all the time. Like, literally, releases are constantly ongoing. Um, and it's funny, you might notice them because we're constantly just releasing stuff into the app or onto the web. And it's just there for you because you're seeing it in lots of different things you're experiencing, not just ordering food. So um, it's almost like wallpaper to a lot of customers. They expect it and it's there. But they don't realize, you know, yeah. that um, it's all developments. But in your business, obviously, you're dealing with a lot of personal data. And we're at a time where people are hyper aware of where their information is going, why it's being used, how it's being used and so on. I assume that's of a paramount concern to you guys as well. Oh yeah, huge. Um, the, every, all the movements and introductions around GDPR last year, um, because we hold so much, we have to be vi extra vig vigilant about what we do with it. Talking of change though, how did you find going from the head of sales to head of the company? Um, so it, it was, do you know what, it wasn't a massive change because we were much smaller back then. So I was kind of, I kind of had to go to the head of company and then we didn't have a marketing director either. So I was, I was kind of marketing okay. and yeah, so there, and we all had many hats on, even though yeah. my title was head of sales, I was doing a lot of other stuff right. um, and we still do. I mean, we're, we're the smallest um, team in group. So we're in 13 countries and Ireland has the smallest team, yet we're one of the most profitable countries. We just do it, we, we're small, we work hard and we do it well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been the kind of theme and culture since I joined. And I've really tried to keep it like that. So 
you know, a lot of other countries will come on to us and say, you know, do you, you'll have a department who will do, and the person talking <laughs> will go, oh, I'm that department as well, you know. Yeah. So um, it wasn't that big a, a change. What, what, what I found dif- difficult was, number one, in sales, you're more out on the road. Mm-hmm. So I found it quite hard, kind of, not hard, but just a change that I was more in the office and there wasn't that kind of in and out, which I w- that was my career to date, was always, my car was my office. So that was a little bit strange and kind of learning how to deal with traffic and the best time to leave and stuff. But I guess it, it also introduced what I now promote in, and I've mentioned earlier, that whole flexibility piece. And because I have a family as well, um, I needed to be flexible to do this job. Um, I look at my friends who are in, I would just say nine to five, but it's not that anymore. It's nine to at earliest six mm-hmm. with no movement, no flexibility, and they have children and whatever. And I actually go, I don't know how you do it. Um, I work from home, I work from the car, I work from a bus stop, I work from the school, play, you know, literally sitting wherever, and I, that flows down through my team. As long as you're doing your job, um, you know, and you're enjoying it, and that there is interaction in the office, really, I, you can be as flexible as you want. Um, so I did find that hard, but I've, I've built it into a nice way of, yeah. of working. And I, I think it, it works for, for us in Just Eat, you know, um, we have a great office, a really nice environment. But if there's days that doesn't work for you, you know, I'm not going to ask where you are. You have the trust in your team. Absolutely, oh, without a doubt. And more importantly, they trust me that I trust them, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so th- there isn't millions of phone calls or can I do the? We just get on with it. And, you know, there is no time for that. Yeah. It's just so busy that it's a case of make your choice, you know, Think quick and be smart and then, you know, everything will be fine. And uh, you mentioned that you've got kids. How do you find mm. the work-life balance when you are sort of in the top job? Um, yeah, I mean, look, it is it is a balance. It's definitely a balancing act and there's good days and bad days. And when I say a bad day, it's nothing horrific. It's just I might be a few minutes late to collect them mm-hmm. or like, you know, someone this morning forgot his whatever and we were in the school car park and it's like oh yeah. but there you know if you consider that really bad then you Your know brand. exactly yeah. it's it's not bad it's again it's flexibility um I do what works for me uh, my team know I'm a mum and they know that I may be working from home I also have other mums on my team so you know it it's not just me that is working with people who don't understand it uh I just actually this morning said in the office we've a whole we've a group of new dads so like uh, we're 10 now so we've moved on when when I started um, our the average age of my team was 28 and now we're kind of early mid 30s mm-hmm. and uh, they're all starting to get married have kids so things are changing you know um, but it, it's just about balance I have a really supportive family and husband at home as well um, and yeah, I, I mean, I guess you just do what you have to do, uh, but it, it definitely hasn't affected me in my career. I would never use being a mother or that, that it's, it hasn't ever held me back. But do you think that we need to change the narrative around that though? Because sometimes when you do talk about gender equality or inequality in the workplace, the mm. whole maternity leave, you know, you're going off there now for nine months or mm. whatever it is. Mm. You know, so you're taking yourself out of the workplace. Do we need to change that narrative in that the workplace needs to become more flexible to facilitate it, and then it doesn't become a big issue? Absolutely, yeah. It, it's the norm. Like mm-hmm. it, it's it is the norm. You see, I suppose from my point of view, having gone through it, it's just normal. It's it's what happens. You yeah. know, what else is going to happen in our world? But we have to facilitate the fact that women would like to come back and progress. They don't want to just come back and be working to make money so they can send their kids. They still want a career um, and it is it's a narrative within companies but what I'm really encouraged by is most big companies are you know they are embracing it at the moment and um, there is there is this like it's it's like a, a need for change but the ch- it's happening but it's not just women it's it's diversity in general it's inclusion but that language is all out there the mm-hmm. fact that we can talk about it and it not be a big thing like yeah. I mean we're constantly talking about it um, I do think there aren't as many women, obviously, in top roles. Um, but I just think, you know, that's just, I don't know why. I don't honestly think it's because they took nine months out and then came back. And like men, 
like it's the right person for the right for the right job in my opinion and um, i do think there there could be an unconscious bias there in some people that you know maybe it's not a female you know some roles aren't for females and we have to change that mm -hmm. but really um it's the right person for the job for me and if it's a woman, I'll just try and be more flexible for that person because I understand it. But men want to be as flexible as, as women now as well, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it's, it's a massive conversation, um, really interesting one. Um, but I think it's more than women. It's, you know, it's, it's inclusion and diversity on a whole other level. And women is just a tiny part of that. Um, and if we start looking at more than just women, it won't become so focused on it, you know, because I think it, when, when you focus on something so much like that, it can almost turn negative without it meaning to. Yeah. Um, and yet, so we actually have to look at what it is. It's just a different gender, you know, and there's other things that are exactly the same that we need to facilitate as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.